Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And it's been, it's been a while. It's been a month for this week's roundtable podcast. We have almost all the usual suspects. We've got the dude buddy, the nightcap OG, Scott Bossman. Scott, how are you? Great, Mark. Good to see you again. It's so good to see you. Um, we've got the technician. Eric Peterson. Eric, how, uh, how are things back in Tennessee? I know you're spending some time at the lake house. We did. Um, July has been a, a nice kind of relaxing time to, to get away and do some other stuff, but uh, it's great to be back on the round table and see everybody's faces. Yeah. Fantastic. Taria putting in the reps, Harris. <laughs> Taria, how are you? I'm doing well. I missed you guys. Doing well. Yeah, yeah. We missed you. Um, and then I love it when you call me Big Papa, Tate Litchfield. Tate, how, how was your month? You know, busy. Uh, like Eric, uh, did some relaxing, spent a lot of good family time with the, the kiddos. And so I'm happy to be getting back into the swing of things. I think uh, I'm still at an age or my family is where we do better with a routine, right? A routine is okay right now. And so uh, my wife and I are ready to get back in the swing of a habit. So I'm happy to be on the call today because this is the start of the routine starting back up again. I'll tell you what, it's not just kids. It's adults too. I miss my routines. Yeah. You get, I get out of sorts, I get a little cranky. Mm -hmm. out of my routine yeah um, and a cranky mark might be worse than a hangry mark it, it could be but right. you know who's never hangry because he starts his day off with a donut that that might be the routine the wisdom of the brain the professor your flight school sherpa scott todd from scott todd that net landmoto.com investorninjas.com scott todd how are you doing? I'm good. Why Why wouldn't you start off your day with a donut? I'll tell you why. Because in a few weeks, I'm going to have to face Taria Harris. And that's why. Because like, I'm going to have to face her too. And I can look her straight in the eye and go, look, I'm not like, I'm, I'm doing it. So yeah. like, if I can do it, you can do it, Mark. What's the problem? No, no. There's yeah. no way. The breakfast of champions. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to see someone that, that's, you know, drinks bone broth for her health. Both of you look great. Mark, here's what I'm worried about, though. Here, uh, This is honestly what I'm, uh, this is what I wake up in the morning and I can already see this happening in a couple of weeks because we're going to be at boot camp and like, you know, we're going to meet for breakfast and, you know, I know I'm going to get razzed because you're going to be like, what? No donut. And, you know, like if we're eating a restaurant and they have like, I don't know, uh, I don't know, egg white omelet or something, I might get that. And then you'll be like, you know what? No donut. Or you're going to bring the donut. Like you got to, it's not always about that same thing, even though I do like it. Okay. But if you guys are eating a breakfast, I'm not just going to eat the one donut and be like, okay, I'm done. I'll see you in the room. Like I might actually sit down and eat too. So no, no rasin. I don't want to hear about it. All right. I mean, you know, I think, Bossman, you're intermittent fasting, aren't you? Uh, a few days a week. No, I, I don't do it every day. I'd say three, okay. four days a week. Yeah, I, I've been doing it for five days. So I, but because it's boot camp, I'm definitely having breakfast. You have I've, been, sure. I've been protein loading a little more uh, in the last couple months, so. Yeah. I mean, we, we could talk about diet and nutrition this entire Roundtable episode, <laughs> but I think we should focus on building wealth, building passive income for our dear listeners. So, Scott Todd, you have an interesting topic. Let's discuss it. Yeah, it was um, I, someone was asking me. Someone was telling me, "Hey, you know, why not just do bigger deals? You know, um, okay, maybe the margin's not there. Why, why not go and buy a property for seventy thousand that you could sell for, you know." 90,000. Why, why not just go do that? Make $20,000 and be done with it. Almost like house flipping, but land 
slipping as opposed to our typical deal is a much lower, uh, much lower deal, right? Like we tend to, my average transaction, I, I tend to deploy about $2,500 and sell for, you know, nine, nine or $10,000. Remember on terms versus a cash deal. So I'm just thinking, like, why not? Why not go do this? What do you guys think? It's a really good question. It's a really good question. And I wonder who would have the answer to that. Why not, dude, buddy? The nightcap OG <laughs> Scott Bossman. Why don't we start with him? All right, sure. So um I mean, I'm I'm of a belief that there's great velocity in these smaller deals. I mean, they, they do not take long to sell. Um, I think I'd rather, you know, if I was going to outlay 50 grand in cash, I'd probably rather buy at this point in time, uh, 10 properties for that total amount and turn around and sell them very quickly and then move on to the next deal. And I'm also, uh, you know, uh, since I've gotten in this, I've been in the mindset of passive income. I, I want a performing note on these deals. So, uh, I want a note. I, I want to buy a property where I get my money out in the first year. And after that, it's pure profit. I want to be able to control that property for the life of the loan. In case there is a default, I take it back and I resell it. There's great power in all those things. Um, I have done an occasional bigger deal. In my experience, they take longer to sell. You're outlaying a lot of cash for a longer period of time. I bought a property for... Um, what was it? $25,000 one time. It took two years to sell. Uh, maybe I wasn't marketing it as well. Maybe I should have listed it with the realtor or that type of thing. I don't know. But um, what if I'd taken that $25,000 and, and bought five, five properties that moved more quickly? So it was a good deal. It ended up being a great deal in the end. Uh, but, but that's kind of my philosophy with it. And um, I, I don't want to outlay all my cash on those deals. Um, now, if the if the margins are different, you know, if I can buy a property for thirty thousand or forty thousand and triple my money on that deal, uh, you know, I'm definitely I'm not going to let that one go. But I may try to find some funding for that deal so it doesn't eat into my business too much. Okay, good. Some really really solid points. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to the technician, Eric Peterson, who I I think I I saw him like kind of hiding. He didn't want to go second. I'm happy to go second. I think um, there's a there's a few things come, that come to mind. I mean, first question is how much capital do you have? If you have hundred thousand or seventy thousand, like you're gonna do this one deal and then you're gonna wait and you're gonna wait and you're gonna wait until that finally sells and now you made your twenty k or or whatever that margin is. But um. You know, it's it's really going to slow down your growth of that capital because it's all tied up in one spot, okay? Um, and I I really do believe that generally speaking, the more expensive properties take substantially longer to sell, okay? Um, you know, our typical terms deals that we talk about all the time. You know, we're trying to turn those in a month, two months, maybe three months max. But those bigger deals, I think you're looking at 12 months, 24 months, easy on a lot of those deals. That, that may not always be the case, but I think that's often the case. Um, next, I think risk. Um, again, if you're putting that much capital into one deal and your margin is, it sounds like a big number of 20K in our example, but there, there's not a lot of room there if something goes wrong. Okay. What if the market turns while you're out there marketing this property and what the, the market's now telling you, you thought you were going to get 90, but now you're going to get 75 or you're going to get 80. Now you've just 15 K has vanished. Um, and that's just because it takes time to move those bigger properties. Not everybody has that kind of capital or is interested in that type of property. Um, and then I think that Again, generally speaking, the people buying those properties are different than our normal buyer. So if you're a land investor in the way that we teach, where you're buying these smaller properties and you're selling them on terms and you reach out to your list and you're like, hey, I've got a $90,000 property I need cash for. 
Um, most of the people on your list probably aren't the right buyer for that property. So we're kind of starting from ground zero and we've got to build that buyer's list of the type of people that want that type of property. And chances are, you know, you're going to have fewer people that want multiple of that type of property as well. But when we're sell selling this smaller dollar stuff, there's lots of people that want more than one of those. You, you brought up a lot of great points. Um, at some point, we should unpack all of that. But I, I really think we should move on to Taria putting in her reps, Harris. <laughs> Um, so when I first heard about it, it kind of put me back in the mindset of the residential things that we used to do prior to, you know, adopting the model from land. And it was a lot of risk. Like Eric said, all of our money went into one deal. We were banking on this one deal. And if anything went wrong, so did our money. Um, we like the model of passive income. And when it comes to those larger deals, a couple things we, because we were invited to participate in a few larger deals, but we chose not to because it would have taken most of our capital. And for us, putting all of our money into one deal just felt a little scary. So it's different if you have an exhaustive um, or if you don't have an exhaustive amount of capital, then you can deploy your money in the manner that you want. For us, it was a little too risky. Um, like Eric said, we don't have buyers available. For the markets we're in now, we know when we purchase property, we have several people on deck who would like that property. We thought it would be scary now to, where are we gonna post this land? You know, Where are we going to find buyers for it? So we chose not to participate in that, um, mostly because it didn't fit our business model. I, I love it. I love it. Um, Tate, I love it when you call me Big Papa. What are your thoughts on this? You know, I'll be the first to admit I've done some big deals um, and they were good. I, you know, would I do them again? That's the real question. And in some cases, the answer is yes. And a lot of cases, the answer is no. Um, and the answer is no for all of the reasons discussed by by the other uh, you know, experts on the round table here today. The risk is high, the reward seems good, but after you go through everything, you wonder if the juice was really worth that squeeze. Um, you know, there's something you said about pay, playing in the 2,500 ballpark, right? Like if something goes wrong on a $2,500 deal and I buy something I 100% shouldn't have purchased, I don't have to quit the business. I can simply chalk it up to a learning mistake, you know, educate my team on it, and we carry on. If I make that same mistake on a $70,000 acquisition, yeah, there's big repercussions on that one. That's a hole that I got to dig myself out of. So I think it has to do with your experience. For me, um, I've always been instructed that it's better to have multiple, you know, irons in the fire, right? I want to have lots of people making monthly payments towards me. I, I think that's the safest way to build a passive income is to have a portfolio of notes, right? Uh, at the end of the day, for me though, it comes down to one thing. I know what my buyers want. I know what they can afford and those properties are not them. Does it mean that there's people out there that you know can't afford that? No, there are absolutely people out there who have $90,000 looking to maybe deploy. I don't know them. My objective is to move lots of land very, very quickly. The buyers that I have, I know what they want. I know what they can afford. And that's what we continue to bring to the market for them. So I think, you know, Scott brings it up. It's, it's a good, it's a, it's a tempting option, right? And you can look at it and think, wow, I really am intrigued by this. And and I want to do deals like this, but never turn your back on what pays the bills. And at the end of the day, my bills are paid by $200 a month properties. That's what pays my bills. And that's what I'm going to stay true to. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. And eventually we will, we will unpack all of this. Maybe, maybe we won't. Maybe. Who maybe knows? We won't. But I think Scott Todd I have no idea what he's going to say, but I have a feeling he's going to take out a calculator. 
<laughs> at some point and do some math. I don't know. I don't know. He can't but resist it. Like that was like a layup. It up. He loves the calculator, man. That guy goes to sleep. For, the, with it. for, the, for those of you <laughs> listening and you don't love math, say, I love numbers and numbers love me. This is like a whole Tony Robbins thing. Get in the mindset of math. Okay. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? All right. So uh, it, it's a very valid question and it's one that I, I've thought about. And, you know, you guys bring up a lot of great points, time, you know, the, the, the potential loss on it, market shifting right now, it seems easy to sell land. I mean, it seems super easy list it with a realtor and someone will come and buy it, you know, like, or list it and someone will come and buy it. And the market isn't always like that. I mean, sometimes the market grinds out. And you guys, you guys did set it up for me. The, the reality is, is I think about yield. Okay. So I think about yield and I'm not so much a big fan of the cash deal. And may, maybe that's just of, of where I am, but I've always wanted the, the monthly income because I didn't want to start off the month having to worry about, okay, how am I going to get my bills paid this month? If I have to go make these sales, that's a lot of stress for me. So what I'd rather do is I'd rather have these little note payments coming in and I just keep picking up these little note payments and you just keep growing that note portfolio. And that's what keeps your bills paid, keeps my bills paid. The other way I look at this is I look at it that when in fact I do a terms deal and I've got somebody that's paying some bills to me, everything I buy, I buy on sale. And that confuses a lot of people when I say it, but just roll with me on this one. Let's say that I wanted to go and buy a car. Let's say I want to go buy, you know, a car that's going to cost me um, seven hundred and fifty dollars a month. That's a pretty nice car, seven fifty a month. And you might go, okay, well, that's fantastic. It is fantastic. But what if I had seven people or eight people that paid me a hundred dollars a month for that for that particular um, for that particular month? That's my car payment now made. And remember to, to generate that, that sale, it didn't cost me $100 to generate the $100 sale. It may have cost me $30 to generate a $100 sale. So if I pay $30 for something, 30 cents on the dollar, I pay $30, $30 to generate 100, and I need to now go buy a car for that, it's like I'm actually paying the car, it's like costing me a third, right? Because I'm, I'm, getting, I'm buying land, I'm converting that land into a note and that note is now paying for my car. So everything I buy in the world is on sale because I'm, I'm not buying it unless the note payment or I can build a note payment that will then offset it. So that's the way I think. I think about everything now in the world is on sale. I buy some land, I create a note, and then I save up that little note portfolio and then I can go get what I want. I want a house, a new house, a big house, no problem. I can build up the note portfolio to get there. And then all I have to do is keep keep rinsing and repeating and keep growing that piece. And then that comes to the question of yield. And I talked to the before, of before about calculating your yield. And you know, if I just go and flip a property, I get a pretty decent yield on there. But what I don't get is that consistent yield on my money. I think that's the one thing that that builds wealth is when you can keep your money moving at 70% a year or 80% a year or 100% a year that money begins to compound and it's the compounding that in fact will set you free in life more so than just a, Oh, here's $20,000. Go have fun with it because the tax man's going to get all, you know, he's going to get his fair share right up front versus over time. That's what I think. I love what everybody had to say, honestly. Um, I don't have too much even to add, but to put it all together, We've got risk component, right? If you're gonna put, if you're gonna invest seventy thousand dollars into a piece of raw land, well, then the question becomes: Is in real estate, we make our money on the buy. Am I buying it at the right price? Because if I if I have seventy thousand dollars to invest, and I'm only gonna make, you know, let's say ten or twenty percent. Well, in the whole world of investments, maybe I buy a stock that's, we haven't even talked about this, it's liquid. I could sell it tomorrow. If we go back to what everybody was saying, 
you buy a, a piece of raw land for $70,000, you now have an asset that is historically illiquid. It takes time to sell that piece of raw land. Even in a crazy hot market, your buyer pool is diminished by the $90,000, $100,000 sale. The whole idea of this model, and for those of you that have listened to the podcast, which is the second one, the best passive income model podcast, I make the argument that this is the best passive income model because we're taking this asset that lasts forever and we're making it affordable for everybody. So we have a massive market. And getting back to Scott's point, our return on investments are 300 to 1,000%. Our yield is 70 to 80% a year. The numbers are insane. But once we start going into this other deal, these other deals, it's the difference between drinking uh, water through a straw or drinking a milkshake through a straw. Which one would you rather do if, you, if the whole goal is to, to get the cup down fastest? I don't know. The, Scott Boston, does that analogy even work anymore? Maybe I'm just hungry. I Maybe don't know. That's it. It could be it, but it's slow. It's slow. And drinking a milkshake really fast can make you sick. Water goes down easy. So the, the liquidity component of what we're doing, we're taking it to really liquid asset. We're making it very liquid right away, which is very difficult to do uh, on these larger deals. Because then we can just say, well, you know, if you just look at the gross dollar amount, yeah. To make twenty thousand um, dollars on a seventy thousand dollar, you know, deal. Okay, sure. Who wouldn't want to make twenty thousand dollars? Why don't we just extrapolate that out? Why not invest seven hundred thousand dollars and sell it for a million dollars? Now we're at three hundred thousand dollars, right? There's nothing Mark, wrong with it. Yeah. One thing I would say is, when I got into this business, I didn't have seventy thousand, right? And so the main thing that attracted me to the land business was it was a low barrier of entry and you know, and you could scale it up. And I just think that sure doing big deals like that is attractive, but what makes this real estate model so, so profitable is a lot of the big people out there who have, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars don't want to touch the land business. And because they don't touch it, it stays relatively you know, off the radar for a lot of people. And so it's a blue ocean in this marketplace. You go, you go start buying $70,000, $100,000 properties. I bet you'll see a lot more competition. That's my, that's my, yeah, two I mean, cents. The, but the risk reward ratio doesn't even make any sense to make right. 10% on your money. You might, you'd, no. you'd, be, you'd it'd be much easier to do it in a different ball, in a, in a, in a completely different investment strategy, for honestly. Sure. Um, and, we can go on and on, I th I th but I think we've covered it. That's that's the reason that we don't teach it. I'm I'm agnostic um, about this whole thing. If someone has a better model, I'm open to it, hundred percent. I just don't know what's better than what we're doing. And but if you if you you know, email me, let me know what's better than what we're doing, because we're building. We're, we take this asset. And we're building a, it's a one-time sale. We get this recurring income every single month, but we got nothing to maintain, nothing to protect. And we're just shuffling paper and making money. If they stop paying, we just do it again. And it's just the machine. So we've got a business, but we're making that we're in these investments. They just keep compounding over time and just keeps growing and growing and growing with very little risk. Almost, I mean, Tate, how, how many deals have you lost money on? Uh, I mean, honestly, I don't think any, but uh, I don't want to, I don't want to say zero because I don't know, but uh, I don't, I can't remember one. Tria, how many deals have you lost money on? Uh, we have not lost money on a deal. Lot, you haven't lost any money. Eric? I can't think of one. Not one. Scott Bossman? Okay, so let's go back to our scenario. We, we've invested seventy thousand dollars, 
Now we've got, let's say it takes a year. We hire a realtor. It takes a year to sell that property for $90,000. Life can get in the way. What, can, what happens if there's a big life event that happens and now you have to sell? That's the other piece of this as well. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd rather, you know, have these singles all day long. Something happens in life. I can flip it and double my money and go on. Right. I, I love this. You know, I think of the Scott Bossman Christmas. It's Christmas. We'll, we'll flip a couple lots, Aaron. We'll pay for the gifts. <laughs> right. There's flexibility in this as well. So I think those are my, my final thoughts. Um, Eric, do you have any final thoughts on this? No, I think we've we've covered it quite well. Tria? Nope. Nope. Dude, buddy? Nope. Going to continue to buy low. <laughs> what was that? Going to continue to buy low. Buy low, sell high. Tate? Yep. No, we're good. All right. Well, I thought it was a really, a really good subject. But now we're at that point in the podcast where we get to put Taria on the spot and ask her for her tip of the week. It's been a month since I've been able to do this. I'm so excited. A website, a resource, a book, something else actual for the auto passive income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. But before we do that, we got to give a shout out to our sponsor, Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life. Go up that mountain of land investing with Scott Todd as your Flight School Sherpa. He will take you up that mountain quickly, safely, efficiently. That flight school tuition ain't going to cost you nothing. Guaranteed, you're going to make that money 180 days or less, cash or terms deals. Just show us your work. What's the next thing you need to do to start building that passive income to the point where your passive income exceeds your fixed expenses? You're out of what I call solo economic dependency. You're working because you want to, not because you have to. Go to landgeek.com forward slash training. Landgeek.com forward slash training. Okay. Taria Harris, what okay. is your tip of the week? My tip of the week, um, it started off, we were looking for different pictures to refresh on our website. So our website has pictures of our land, but it also has scenic pictures um, for the areas that we like to sell in. And so I found this website, but then I also found a, several pictures of land on it as well. It's called unsplash.com. Unsplash.com. And and they're free. You can download them. They do ask if you use them that you maybe give a shout out on social media to the photographer um, who took them. But for the most part, it's just Unsplash. And it's a bunch of pictures that you can download. Wow. The internet source of freely usable images. That's fantastic. It's pretty Um, cool. That's really cool. So... I will tell you that it's really important that you you use these free pictures because um, I am actually <laughs> getting hassled by a patent. Is it a patent troll company or a copyright troll company? These 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 lawyers they use artificial intelligence. They scan through millions of websites. And for whatever reason, like we did a blog post and we had a Ted Turner picture, picture of Ted Turner on our website. And then the, the, the troll emails us and says, you're in violation of our client Reuters image copyright. And they wanted like, you know, let's, we'll settle this for like $2,500. Like we took the image down and the, I'm like, okay, obviously they're a troll. They'll, they'll go away. No, they have not gone away. They keep asking me to pay them or they're going to take me to court for like, you know, this for little $2,500. Image. $2,500 a settle. Like we can do this, this, and this. And it's true. They can legally. It's, you know, if you're an attorney out there and you're struggling, the troll business is not bad if you get the right software. <laughs> That's terrible. Because I, I mean, like you do the, you do the calculus. You're like, you know what? I should have gone to Unsplash, but I didn't. I'd make these guys go away for five hundred bucks. Why not? It's a, it's a terrible, great business at the same time. 
anyways, if you, I, I can find you, know, you some pictures of Ted Turner on Unsplash. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to exist. No, there aren't any. <laughs> right. Um, so there you go. There you go. So Unsplash, that, that's a great tip. And um, so, you know, go through your pictures right now on your website and make sure you have not taken any copyrighted material learned from my mistake, which when I spoke to my attorney, he's like, well, just blame it on your web developer. But have them have them go after that. So now I have to like make a choice. <laughs> do I, now do I throw someone else under throw the bus? Throw your web developer under the bus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So James, if you're listening, I am not going to throw you under the bus. <laughs> I promise. Uh, but you know, if you want me to, because you're in the Philippines and you don't think they're going to be able to get you, take one for the team. Take one for the team. Let me know. <laughs> you know, no worries. Okay. Um, well, that's a great tip of the week. Uh, I want to just thank the listeners and remind them that the only way that we're going to be able to get Taria to continue doing tips of the week, besides bribing her with bone broth, is if you do us three favors, you got to follow, subscribe, uh, or rate, review the podcast. We're going to do a new giveaway on the review. Send us a screenshot of that review, support at the I'm going to send you a signed copy of Dirt Rich, which, um, one day could be worth a lot of money or who knows a signed copy. You never know rare book market. It's not a bad business. Scott Todd, how come we don't have anybody who invests in rare, rare books on the podcast? I got a book. I got a book. You got a book. I got a you got a rare book. Yeah, remember we got a uh, we you and I ordered uh we we each had the same book. It's uh I really don't know why people love this book, but they do, and we 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 each have a copy of it. I think we paid like thirty dollars each for it, and last I looked, the book was selling for nine thousand. So, I mean, we're doing pretty good, man. That's right. That's right. So, you know. Review the podcast, and that Dirt Rich book might be worth $9,000 one day. I have a note in the front of the book, like on the cover. I told my kids, do not throw this book away. Do not donate this book. Sell this book. <laughs> and if I find out that you donated it, I'm coming for you. <laughs> wow. We just got a really scary glimpse of the Scott Todd Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. I'm sure it's all just turkey, mashed potatoes, and Don't here's know. how here's what we do with our assets, kids, that are in trust. That's right. <laughs> no problem. All right. Well, thanks everybody. And um Let's just do this. Our, it's our first time doing this in a month. One, two, three. Let's Let freedom, freedom, freedom ring. ring. Boy, I bet you Zeno misses this. Hopefully he'll be back next week. I don't know. Anyways, did anybody watch anything good over the over July? No. Huh. No, no. Been watching um, White Lotus. Yeah, been watching that. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's pretty interesting so far. Yeah, it's on HBO Max. That's pretty good. Um, Outer Banks on Netflix is pretty good. Okay, that's such a teenager show, Scott Todd. Listen, oh, you want to talk? Uh, I don't know if I can say this on the podcast or not. Uh, you should see the show that that we like because look, dog days of summer, there's not much to watch, right? So, we're on uh HBO Max. I better not say it, I better not. I, I have to tell you guys privately what we're watching, but you know, you know, it's not, it's not bad, but it's like you know, it's not, it's not x rated per se. I don't really like the title of it, but you know, I'm really shocked that I'm watching this show. And I'm telling my wife, like, I'm shocked I'm watching this thing, but I bet I know what good. show it is. Yeah. yeah, it's 
is island. You with me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm with yeah, you. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, that's not it, Tate. It's it's island. It has island in it. Yeah. Let's just call it Boy Island. Let's just call it Boy Island, okay? There you go. Yeah. yeah. Letter Boy Island. We'll just stop there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got I it. I think I pushed it far enough. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, I have not heard of the show. I, I, I mean, I'm like, well, let's just watch this. And it's an eye opener. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that's funny. Any any good books over the summer? Any good books? How do you need a book when you have this trash TV to watch? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, that's true. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what I've been reading uh, again and really loving. You, you know, we don't talk enough about it is the Cash Flow Quadrant, Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah, that's an awesome book. That's a great book. I don't know if I like that more than Rich Dad Poor Dad. So good, and it so it, it applies so much to what we teach, what we talk about, um, for sure. But I read a good book. It's not a, uh, not a you know business book or anything else like that. It's called In the Heart of the Sea. It's uh, about the real life story of Moby Dick. It's oh. terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Could not put it down. It's like a wow. true story about the survivors and the ordeal that they went through. And it makes the original story of Moby Dick just sound like a cakewalk. This was truly horrific what these sailors endured. Scary stuff. Very cool. You you like those kinds of books of against all odds books. Yeah, I do. I, I it's it's you know, it's a book of survival, it's a book of against the odds and zero chance of survival. And it's like, yeah, they had to eat 80% of their crew members, but a handful of them survived, you know, that's all right. Just yeah. pretty amazing what they, what the human mind can do when it's pushed to that point. So scary stuff. I'm not hanging out with Tate. That's for sure. Yeah, no. That's exactly Listen, what I was I, at boot camp. Like, I've got it all prepared. I've thought through this and like, you know, don't ask me if I could eat you, Scott. Don't if I, ask if I find myself stuck on an F boy up on an island. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I just on an island. Bleep that out. On an island with Tate. I am not getting near him if, if it's just like him and I. I don't know what to say. Oh boy. I mean a hangry Mark Podolsky, you never know either. Maybe, maybe. Uh, uh, you know, when it comes to cannibalism, <laughs> I, I, I at that point I'm just like, you know what? I'd just rather die. Yes. You know, you know, well, you, you know, know who I would take my chances with though. Who is the Harrises? Because they can survive on bone broth or bone. <laughs> yeah, I, exactly. I'm going. That's just man. it, Scott. They're going for your bone broth. <laughs> they, oh, <laughs> I didn't think right. about that way. I didn't think about that way. Jeez. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> going for that marrow gotcha gotcha tate okay i'm out okay well, i i think i tell you what we have to watch out for be tate eric and scott because tria scott and i and mike we all intermittent fast like we can handle it but you know you're in trouble we can handle yeah. being hungry for a few days we can handle it's it. you three we'd have to look out for i ate breakfast like, this like morning survivor where we're like you know going off into different groups it'd be like lord of the flies yeah. honestly yeah yeah it'd be bad i ate breakfast this morning and by the time i got to my office you know 15 seconds later i needed another snack so you're you're in for it no i could go 30 days no food so, 30 days no food okay. we'd be and, okay. and not in a bad mood no it's amazing i want to do it just to see if i can do it you can do it. Let me know. I'll send you a 30 day supply of bone broth. We'll get you nice. through. All right. I mean, you're already pretty lean, Mark. You're pretty lean. No, I, I don't want to do it to lose weight. I just want to do it. So, but if, you would lose weight. <laughs> There's no way around weight. that. Yeah. You'd lose uh, a lot. I, yeah. I don't want to lose. I don't want to lose any more weight. Um, Although I don't know, it'd be kind of cool. Go to, you know, go to boot camp with a six pack. 
<laughs> yeah, okay. A beer? Two pack. <laughs> One pack. No, not after Did 30 Did you hear minutes. the doubt in Taria's voice there when you said that? I think that was doubt. <laughs> that was a lot of doubt. <laughs> I yeah. can just imagine okay, Mark walking bit. in with his six pack of beer, Eric walking in with his rib in his mouth. Like, you guys would be a hoot. <laughs> How did we uh, ever this... survive the last month without all this garbage talk? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how the listeners are surviving without it. Yeah. But I, I, I feel like it's, it's to the point where, like, it's devolving. You know, Tate kind of gives that look like, all right, let's it's stop time. recording. It's time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Start your journey at www.thelandgeek.com and www.scotttodd.net. Read and review the podcast and email support at thelandgeek.com. Your screenshot for a free passive income launch kit.